Today I'll be showing you how to use Unity's input system. It's been out for a while now, but it's only available through the Package Manager, so make sure you have it installed by going to Window, Package Manager, and then go to Packages, Unity Registry, and here we can see all of Unity's packages that we can download, and if you scroll down to Input System, or you can search it in the search bar here, then on the bottom right there's an Install button. You can also open it up and see other versions, so you can download previous versions, or if you want, you can go to the Settings icon up here, Advanced Project Settings, and you can enable Preview Packages if you'd like to download a preview package. So if you enable that, you'll see that now all the preview packages appear, and these are the latest versions that may contain some fixes or extra features. So if you see that something's not working in a previous version, you might want to upgrade and it might be fixed on the newer version. You can check the docs for more information about version features. So I'm just going to install 1.0.2, install, then here click yes. It's going to restart the editor, and restarting the editor installed the input system into our project. One last thing I want to mention is that in the input system, they have some samples you can download if you want to see how something's done. Rebinding UI, on-screen controls, custom device, simple multiplayer. So exit out. So there's a couple ways how to use the new input system. I'll be showing you some of them, and then I'll be telling you which ones are the recommended ones. So what's good about the input system is that it separates the input and the device. So it's kind of an abstraction layer for your input, and that makes it easily transferable between different pieces of your code. So in this case, you can have your input in a central place, and then have other scripts access it easily if they need that input information. And what's great about the input system is that it's very cross-platform friendly, which I will show you in a moment why it's so cross-platform friendly. So there's a couple ways to use this. First, I'm going to make a scripts folder, right-click, create scripts. And then what we can do is right click and create an input action asset. And then we can name this. So this is where our controls are going to be and our actions. So let's say we want our player controls here. And so if you press enter or double click that, this will pop up. So we have some stuff going on here. The first thing that you need to do is add an action map. And an action map will be a grouping of actions that we want our player to perform. So let's say we add an action map here, and let's say we want this player to perform certain actions on the land. So you'd have an action land map, and let's say you have different controls for another area, such as a water area. Then you can create another action map and call that water, and then you can switch between these two action maps depending on what section of your game you're on. So I'm just going to right click and cut this. So if you click your action map, you see your actions. So this is what you want your player to be able to do. So for example, if I press F2 here, I can rename this move. We want the player to move. If we add an action up here with the plus button, let's say we want the player to jump. And let's say we also want this explosion effect, explosion. So these are our actions that our player can perform. However, we need to bind controls to it or else Unity won't know what control will activate this action. So if we click the jump one, for example, on the right, you see we have this action type. There's three that we can choose from. Currently, it's a button, which this is perfect for jumping because it's just one button that we want to press. However, there's also value and pass through. If you click value, for example, you'll see we have a control type here. And value lets you select any one of these types. So let's say you want your action to be a type of vector 2, which we'll need to do that for our move. Then you can select vector 2, and this action will return a vector 2. So you can choose any one of these that you may need. Integer, quaternion, touch for touchscreen, axis, and this returns a range of numbers on one axis. So in this case, let's just choose button. And if you're wondering between value and pass-through, value does a disambiguation process, which if you have multiple controls connected at the same time, it basically selects a main one, while pass-through doesn't select the main one and just receives all the input. So in most cases, you'd want value because the player would only be using one control at a time, usually, and would need to select a main control. So for now, I'm going to select button. And if we go to no binding here, we can select a path for our binding. So here we can type it in directly. Let's say I want the space bar. I can type it there or I can press listen and then I can press it on the keyboard and click it there as well. Now this is one binding. So whenever this is pressed, this action will be executed. And what's good about the input system is that it's event based. So the input system supports certain events. It has a started, performed and canceled. So when your action has been started, so in the case of a button, when we start to press it down, it'll issue this callback called started and performed, and we can subscribe to those callbacks. Basically, we listen to the input system, 
and listen to when these are executed and then we can do certain things depending on when these are executed. And then there's canceled, which means we have lifted our finger from the button. And so depending on the type, so value button or pass through, these callbacks might be issued at different times. I have a whole video on this if you're interested, the link is in the description. But what's cool here is that if we go back to the jump, we can add another binding here. And now, for example, we can add a gamepad binding and let's say we want the button self of the gamepad to trigger our jump. So a gamepad is just like a controller. Or if you want to be more specific with your gamepad, instead of a gamepad, you can add an Xbox controller directly. So you can add the A key of the Xbox controller if you'd like. And pressing any one of these will trigger this action. So if we go to move now, we can set the action type to value and the control type to vector two. So this is a little bit different for keyboard. For example, if we want to use a WASD or arrow keys, there's no real way to bind one key to a vector two. So what Unity has done here is that you can press this add binding here and we can add a 2D vector composite. And I can just name this WASD. I'm just gonna cut this one. So a composite here is a grouping of different bindings and you can add in a binding for each one of these. So if I press listen, W on the down, I can go to path, listen, S, left, path, listen, A, and right, listen, D. So now I have the WASD mapped here. And what it does is that the composite sources these values. So it listens to every one of these and then combines them into a vector two so that you can access it correctly. So in this case, up and down is on the Y axis of the vector two and left and right is on the X axis. If you're pressing left, it returns negative one on the X. And if you're pressing right, it returns one on the X of the vector two. And if you're not pressing anything, it returns zero. So what's cool here is that you can add another 2D vector composite. And let's say you want arrow keys to also activate this move action. Then you can bind these arrow keys here, listen up arrow, down arrow, left and right. And once again, we can add another binding. And this time we can go to gamepad and add in one of the sticks, which is one of the joysticks on the controller. So let's say we also want to move with the controller left stick. So what's great about the input system is that we can easily support cross-platform controls by just quickly adding a binding to our existing actions. And the code that we'll use to access these doesn't change, whether it's on PC or on PlayStation or controller, unless you want something specific per platform. And for the explosion, I'm just gonna add a binding of E here. One thing I wanna mention before we continue is that there's something called interactions and processors. With interactions, let's go to the jump here. The interactions will basically determine when these actions are executed so for example, if we have a hold interaction, we'll have to hold down the key for a certain time. So hold time, which is 0.4 seconds. And only then will this be performed. You can deselect the default value and put in how long you want there. And the press point is basically how hard you need to press it, which for a keyboard button doesn't really matter because it has no sensitivity, but for a controller, you'd have to press it past the halfway point of a trigger. For example, on the back of the controller, there's the triggers that change values from zero to one. In this case, you have to press it more than 0.5. Additionally, you can open the input settings and create your own settings asset to set some default values for the input system here. And then for processors, these just process your values after they've been received. So for example, if you want to clamp, invert, or normalize this value or scale it or add a dead zone to it, then you can do so here. And I have some videos on this if you're interested. And last thing I want to mention is that if you have a float value, for example, a button is a type of float since it only returns one value, you can add a axis here or you can add a modifier, which I have a video that goes over this, but it's kind of like a combo where it'll be executed if you press both of these buttons at the same time, the button and the modifier. And once you're pressing both of these, it'll give you the value of the button. So this would be good for sprinting with the button being W and the modifier being shift as an example. Additionally, if you want more control over the different devices, you can go up here, no control schemes, click it and add a control scheme. So let's say for example, you're making your game for mobile and for desktop, you can have a desktop control scheme. And here you can add in the required devices that you need for this input to work. So for desktop, I need a keyboard and I'd also need a mouse. And you can make these optional or required. And once you save your control scheme, you can access it there. And then you'll see that once we click a binding, there's an extra option here, use in control scheme. So for our space, which is on our desktop, we can click that there. And this can be used to require certain devices for certain control schemes. 
So the player needs to have a mouse to play this game. Then you can set a required field on the mouse for a control scheme corresponding to desktop or PC. For now, I'm just going to delete this control scheme. So up here, click Save Asset to save your asset. And now we have this asset with our input, and now we actually need to use this input. So there's several ways that we can do this. So the first way is generating a C Sharp class of our input. So if we click here, this will generate a C Sharp class that we can access. Here you want to make sure your file name and your class name are the same. So by default, it's the same. You'll see playercontrols.cs and our class name is player controls. And you can add in your own namespace here if you'd like. So just click apply here and you'll see that a script will appear down here. If you double click it, you'll see that there's a lot of stuff going on here. These are the actions that we made in our input action asset and they've been converted to a type of JSON format. So you can see we have our map, our land map, and our move and jump and explosion here. And here are the bindings, WASD, up, down, left, right, and it just goes on. And here they're just accessing some of your action maps and actions. And these are some of the functions that you can call if you have a reference to the script. You see, you can also add a mask to your binding, which you can use if you want your binding to be visible in a certain action or map or asset but you don't want it to be visible in another map, which you can find more information on the documentation for this. But you see here that it's just constructing these functions that we can use. These are the events that we can subscribe to, started, performed, and canceled, and it just uses some sort of wrapper on the input system. Additionally, they create this interface that you can inherit from, and you can derive these functions that will be called when you move, jump, or on explosion. So I'm going to show you this way and then I'm going to show you how to use the player input component, which is the recommended way, but it's very similar, the code. So if you right click create C sharp script, let's call this player controller. All right. So here I've erased the functions and we get a reference to our player controls. So first we need a reference to our player controls, private player controls, player controls. So make sure you pay attention to the capitalization here. Then I want to instantiate these controls because this is just a reference to the class, but we don't have an instance of the controls. So we can do player controls equals new player controls. So you'd think you're done, but you need to actually enable the action map if you want to read the input from it. So what I usually do is that on the on enable function in mono behavior here, you can do player controls dot enable. And then in the on disable function, we want to make sure to disable these controls. So on enable is called when the script is enabled and this is called when the script is disabled. All right. And so I want to make sure that these are enabled before I use them. So I'm not going to put any of the actual logic in awake, but instead I'm going to put it on the start function. So there's two ways that we can use this. We can either subscribe to the events and listen for when our input is being triggered and do something when it's triggered one time, or we can continuously read our input as you usually do with the old input system. So in the update function here, we can do player controls dot, and you can see all of the stuff we can access here. So we can access the asset itself, which it shows you what it returns here, the binding mask of our player controls, the control schemes available devices, and our action map land. So we can do player controls dot land dot. And then you see, we have our different actions here, explosion, jump and move. So for example, if we want to know our move values, we can do dot move. And then we can do dot. Make sure to read all of these to see what you can access here. You can access the bindings or the map, but what we want is the read value dot read value. And then what we're going to do here is we're going to put this bracket and we have to put in the type of what we're expecting. So we're expecting this to be a vector two. So we have to do read value and then vector two. And then here we can just do vector two move and then we will receive our move input. So you can do debug.log here and move, for example. Similar to the move, we can do player controls dot land dot jump. And then we can do either read value float. This is a button. So it's going to be a float or I'm going to copy this. If you want to check if it has jumped. So if we have jumped dot jumped, we can do the same thing dot read value float equals one. So if it equals one, it has jumped or here we can do triggered. So triggered will be true on the frame that it has been performed. 
So when we press our jump key down, this will be triggered. All right, and you can test that out if you'd like. You can do a simple debug.log and print out jump. And I'm just gonna comment these out here. Then you can make a new game object, create empty. Then you can right click and create a empty game object on the scene. I'm gonna call this player. And then we can add in our script, which is our player controller script. So in the console, you'll see that our moves are being printed, which there's a lot of values, so we can collapse that. So if I press WAC, you'll see that now the input is changing. And if I press jump, you'll see that the jump is printed out. All right, so that's how you can read the value directly. If you want to subscribe to an event and have something happen one time, or maybe start a curtain when something has happened, so you can have more control over it and not populate the update function too much, we can do playercontrols.land.move, similar to that. But now we can do dot .started, or we can do dot .performed, or we can do dot .canceled. Let's do our explosion here, dot explosion, and let's do perform. So when we have performed our explosion, this is an event, so we have to subscribe to it. Basically, an event sends out something, and then this script needs to tell the event that it's listening, and to do that, we do this, plus equals, basically saying we're listening here, and then we can just call an explosion function that we need to make. So whenever this has been performed, then call the explosion function, which we can do right here, private void explosion. And you'll see it's still red error because this requires a parameter input action dot callback context. So we can just copy that or type it here. So this is the input and we can just call this context, which you'll see that this doesn't recognize it. And it's because we have not imported. If you go up, you can do using unity engine dot input system. And so now we can use the functions available in the input system and the objects by importing this namespace. And we can erase these two namespaces since we don't use them right now, unless you use them. So here, this will be called when our explosion is performed. Here you can do whatever you want, debug.log explosion. Or if you want to read the input, you can do context.read value, similar to how we did before, float, since this is of type float. Or you can do context dot read value as button. So this will return a Boolean if it is pressed. So if you wanted to compare this to a Boolean, you'd have to do equals equals one since it's a float, but we can just call this function instead. And additionally, you can access some other parameters like when the action was started, the current time, the control associated with it, its duration, if it has an interaction on it, etc. So I'm just gonna copy this here just to show you the different callbacks here and put this here. So these are the three callbacks that you can use. And you have to make sure to unsubscribe to this when you're done. So for example, here, plus minus, you have to make sure to minus equals somewhere in your code. So you have to just make sure to do this once you're done somewhere on your code. So you can do this probably on the on disable function here. And if you'd like, you can also put this after the on enable function. It's up to you. So that's basically how to use the input system. You can either subscribe to the events or you can read the values directly if you'd like. However, this is not the recommended Unity way because the problem with this is that since it generates the script, the script can't really be changed easily. So for rebinding keys, it might be a little difficult to do it this way. You could definitely do it, but Unity has a component that they've already made to make life easy for us. So under the player, we can add a component, player input component. And here we can add in our input action asset that we made. So you can click this circle here and double click your player controls. You can select the default map, which is land. So you see there's already some stuff built in. You can select the default map. This is more for if you're doing a local multiplayer game and each player has their own UI or camera, you'd assign it there. And the input system has a player input manager that manages the different players, which is good for local multiplayer, which I have a video on. So this player input component has some nice functions that we can use off the bat. You see that we can access this directly from our script with get component player input, or we can use a behavior. So currently with send messages, it'll check each script attached to this game object. And if it has these functions defined, on move, on jump, on explosion, either one of those, it'll be called whenever these actions are being performed. However, I recommend doing invoke unity events instead so you can open this up. And I actually don't even recommend doing this 
but I'll explain to you in a moment. So if you open up events and land, you'll see that we have move, jump, and explosion. And we can add here a function. So you can drag in your player controller as an example. And then you can call a function on your player controller. So make sure that this function takes in a callback context, similar to how I showed you that the event takes it. So in my case, nothing shows up because I didn't make it public. So you have to also make it public, which is another thing I don't like. You're exposing functions that don't need to be exposed. So in the function, now you can see explosion is at the top and it'll call this explosion when this is activated. So just to test it out, I'm going to put it under explosion and I'm going to remove these two context read values. And I'm going to show you what happens in this case when I press the explosion button. So if I press E, you'll see it prints it six times. Why is it printing it so many times? Well, it's because you may notice we have a started, performed, and dot canceled callback. However, here we only have one event. So this is calling it for the started and the performed and also the canceled callback. So I'm just going to print out the value. You see it's one, four times, and then it's zero, two times when I press the button. So you can see this can get pretty crazy pretty fast. So I'm just going to remove that from the events here. And instead in our script, we're going to change this up a little bit to use the player input component. So I'm just going to comment this out. And let's get a reference to our player input, private player input, player input. And make sure for this to have this unity engine.input system namespace. Then on our awake function, we can get a reference to our player input component, get component player input. And from there, it's a little different. We do player input dot actions to access our actions. And then we need to refer to it with a string. So in this case, we need to refer to our jump action with a jump string. And then we can do dot read value float as usual, or we can subscribe to those events dot started performed and canceled. However, you'll see that using a string can lead to some unnecessary bugs if you mistype it many times. So what you can do is do a private input action and we can name it jump action. And this will kind of store our controls. So here we can just do jump action equals our dot actions jump. So now we can store our jump action. And from there we can do jump action dot read value, flow, etc. And if you're interested with the player input provides, you can do dot player input and see what functions it has here. So you see we have a switch current action map that isn't available with the C-sharp generated script. So here we can easily switch our action map. And if we have the ID of the action map or the name, we can just input it there and it'll switch to that action map. You can also switch the current control scheme if you'd like. And it just makes it easier to do rebinding of the keys. So if you want the player to be able to rebind their keys, depending on what they like, it's just easier if it's more dynamic instead of having to access this complicated JSON values. And I have a video on rebinding if you're interested. So one other thing I want to mention, I'm going to uncomment this script, is that on some of my videos, I show subscribing to events as so. So this is a event lambda. And what I'm doing here is that instead of subscribing directly, first I'm subscribing and then this is the value that's passed through. So if you want the context or you can call it context, whatever you want. So if you want the actual value, you can add a variable there. And then here, then you can call explosion and then pass in your context as per usual. However, if you don't really need the context, you can add an underscore there and you can call a function that doesn't need it. So if I have an explosion function here, I can just call the explosion without anything. Or if you don't want to call a function, you can just do some brackets and do like debug.log or whatever you want here. The issue with this is that it's a little hard to remove the Lambda event handler, which means unsubscribing from it, since you don't have a direct reference to the function that you're calling. In this case, you do when we do it this way. And so I'll link this in the description if you're interested and want to tackle this issue. But a lot of people just have this helper function that takes in the context, but doesn't actually do anything with it. And so yeah, that's the basics of the input system. Last two things I want to mention is that if you have UI, so let's add a text, for example, make sure to go to the event system and replace 
the old input system module with the new one. You just click that button there. I have a more detailed video on that. And there's also this window analysis input debugger that comes with the input system that you can easily debug your input with. For example, if you click the keyboard, you can see all the keyboard keys and it'll show you when they're being pressed, which I have another video on this. Additionally, if you're migrating from the old input system, Unity has this nice documentation that you can see where they show the previous and how it translates to the current. And what you might find interesting here is if you want to check if there's any key being pressed, you can do keyboard.current.anyKey is pressed. Or if you want to check if a current mouse button is checked, you can do button and then dot is pressed. And you can see that if we just put this here directly, we can access that value. Additionally, if you want to tell when any key has been pressed down, you can just use was updated this frame instead of is pressed. If you're interested in touch input, I have a whole other video that covers that, that I'll link in the description as well. And so some other questions I get are how to use .get access raw with the new input system. Unfortunately, you can't do that. Instead, you can just read the unprocessed value by doing .read unprocessed value, and then you can do whatever you want with it. You also have this button control dot is pressed, which you can use if you don't have a binding and you just want to check if a certain button is pressed right here. And you also have this was pressed this frame along with was released this frame. So for example, mouse dot current dot left button dot, and then you can do was pressed this frame, or you can do was released this frame or is pressed. And two other things I want to mention is that if you don't want to use the input action asset, there's two other ways you can make input actions. Then here you can actually reference an input action or an input action reference. So for example, on our player controller, if we reference an input action, so this is called action, in the action you can add right here a binding, an axis composite, vector, or a modifier. So this is similar to the input action asset, but if you only want one control or one binding and you don't necessarily want to make a whole map or a whole asset for it, then you can make one here and it's a similar process. You can double click there to make a binding and assign whatever binding you'd like there along with the interactions and processors. Additionally, you can get an input action reference, which is similar to an input action, but instead it just references an input action that you've already made, which you can click this circle here. And these are the ones we made in our input action asset. So if you want to get a reference to a specific action, then you can use an input action reference. Additionally, if you don't want to use any one of those and you want to make your own input actions dynamically via code, then luckily the input system supports that. So right here, for example, we can do new input action and then we can assign a binding to our input action. So you just do binding colon and then you have to have a string of your binding. So in this case, we have to have a device within these brackets. So in our case, we want a gamepad. So we do bracket gamepad, close bracket, slash the actual name of the action. So the button self or the self button of the gamepad. And you can find these out by making either an input action asset and creating a binding. And you'll see in the paths, it has all the names. So for example, we have a left stick here. So if you want the left stick, you'd have to use camel case notation. So left stick as an example, or you can use the input debugger, which is under window analysis input debugger. And then you can go to a certain device. So let's say keyboard, and then you can see all the names of the keys that it supports. Additionally, you can add more bindings by calling action right here, dot add binding. So this is a type of input action. So you can do dot add binding and you can add another binding if you'd like. And if you'd like to add an interaction, you can do with interactions, the name of the interaction in string format along with its parameters. So in this case is a duration of 0.8 seconds. And there's also a dot with processor function or dot with processors. And I have videos covering each one of these if you're interested. And make sure to enable your action. Another way to dynamically make an input action is similar to the first example. We enter a binding, but we can also add in a processor within this new input action call. So you just do processors colon and then your processor name along with the values. So in this case, it's an invert processor, which inverts a value. And in the case of a float, this doesn't have any values, so we can just leave it blank. And don't forget to enable your action. Additionally, you can add a name here if you want it to be easily recognizable. My binding. And just to show you that it works, I've replaced this with mouse left button, 
I've enabled it and I've subscribed to the perform callback. However, I don't need the context, so I put an underscore and then I just do debug.log clicking. And you'll see that now it clicks. And you'll see that when we go to window analysis input debugger, which helps debug your input and you press play under actions. Now my binding appears, which is what we have named the action along with the actual binding. However, I don't really like this method because you can make a lot of mistakes with the string names and it could potentially not work and you might not know why for a long time. So I recommend using either an input action, an action reference or an action asset. So my recommended path is using the input action asset and using the player input component. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video and you found it useful. Hopefully you'll be using the input system in the future. It's really cool and easy to set up. It might take a little while to get used to it, but once you do, it's very much worth it. So if you enjoyed the video, please make sure to like and subscribe. It'll help me out a lot. And I'd like to thank all my patrons for the support. Thank you so much for your support. It makes videos like these possible. And with that, I'd like to thank my new patrons. In the enthusiastic tier, we have Brandt, Ao, Alan, Andy, Ansu, Revenge Tech, and Matthew Wright. And I apologize for some pronunciations that I might have gotten wrong. Thank you so much again for all of your support. It is really appreciated. And if you're interested, the link is in the description. I offer source code early access and an exclusive Discord channel, along with some other perks. And if you're not already on the Discord channel, you can join. The link is in the description. You can chat, post memes, or ask for help. So thank you so much for watching once again, and I'll see you next time.